Chapter Thirteen of Dash for Khartoum. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Dash for Khartoum by George Alfred Henty. Chapter Thirteen. Abu Kru. Sergeant Bowen and Edgar were by no means the only men who straggled away from the main body during that terrible night's march from the wells of abu Klea. many straggled some managed to rejoin the column in the morning others wandered away and were never heard of again morning found the exhausted and worn-out men and animals still at a distance from the nile some miles away a long line of verdure showed where the river lay but the general felt that at present the men could do no more and that a halt for some hours was absolutely necessary parties of the enemy's horse and footmen could be seen among the sand hills and distant shots had already been fired the object of the terrible march had failed it was no longer possible to reach the river without fighting again and to fight as they were encumbered with the baggage train and overpowered with fatigue was but to court disaster therefore a halt was ordered to the soldiers the order was unwelcome tired as they were they would rather now that the river was but some four miles away have pushed straight on and have done with it but the condition of the animals positively forbade this a camping ground was chosen on a bare gravelly place on the scrub where the ground rose slightly the work of unloading and arranging the camels at once began but before it was concluded a dropping fire was opened by the natives from the long grass and bush in the distance the troops were set to work to erect a zareba with the saddles biscuit boxes and other stores while parties of skirmishers endeavored to keep down the fire of the enemy this however was a difficult task as the natives were entirely concealed and the men could only fire at the puffs of smoke arising from the grass and bushes to the arabs however the camp presented a clear mark and the sharp rap of the musket balls as they struck the wall or the thud with which they buried themselves among the crowd of kneeling camels was very frequent several men were hit and soon after nine o'clock the report spread through the camp that sir herbert stuart had received a very dangerous if not mortal wound the news caused deep sorrow throughout the troops the general was most popular both with the officers and men and there was not one but felt that his loss would be a personal one it was moreover most unfortunate for the expedition itself at such a moment to be deprived of its leader before starting colonel burnaby had been designated to assume the command in case of any accident happening to the general but burnaby had fallen at abu Klea, and it therefore devolved upon sir charles wilson who was accompanying the force solely in a diplomatic capacity and who was to push up the river in one of the steamers and communicate with general gordon as soon as the force reached the nile soon afterwards orders were given that a ridge of ground sixty yards distant on the right front should be occupied as from that point the ground beyond was commanded to a considerable distance and the enemy thus prevented from gathering for a sudden rush from that direction skinner and easton were lying down together under cover of the wall when the order was given skinner was energetically denouncing the night march and the present halt easton was smiling quietly and occasionally pointing out the difficulties which would have ensued had his companion's view of the matter been adopted it is beastly lying here doing nothing skinner finally grumbled well there is no occasion for you to do so easton said as an officer passed along saying that volunteers were required to carry boxes to build a small work on the ridge skinner at once jumped to his feet ran to the pile of biscuit boxes seized two of them 
swung them on to his shoulders and started for the ridge easton followed in more leisurely fashion and a number of other officers and men at once set about the work it was not pleasant as soon as the concealed enemy saw what was being done they directed their fire upon the party and the bullets flew fast across the ground that had to be passed over several men dropped but the work was continued vigorously and in the course of an hour a small work was raised upon the ridge and a half company placed there as its garrison hour after hour went on the fire of the enemy getting heavier and heavier the men dropping fast well easton what do you think of it now skinner asked i think it is most annoying easton said i cannot think why we don't do something i suppose the general being hit has upset the arrangements if we are going to move i don't see what advantage there is in putting it off it isn't as if we were getting any rest here i hope to goodness we are not going to wait here until dark every hour we stop adds to the casualties i hear two of the special correspondents have been killed cameron of the standard and st ledger herbert of the post the camels are being killed in scores another four and twenty hours of this work there won't be enough men left to fight our way down to the river it has got to be done and we might just as well do it at once it was not until half past three that the welcome order was given to prepare to move forward a portion of the heavy camel regiment the hussars and naval brigade were left behind with the three guns to hold the enclosure while the rest formed in square as at abu Klea, advanced the camels with the wounded were in the centre the marines and grenadiers formed the front of the square the cold stream and scots guards were on the right the mounted infantry on the left the sussex and the remainder of the heavies in the rear the fire of the enemy redoubled as the square set out on its way halting occasionally to fire a few volleys at the spots where the enemy's fire was thickest the square made its way gradually onward keeping as much as possible on ridges so as to avoid being surrounded by the enemy placed in commanding positions at last the fire of the arabs suddenly ceased and a great crowd several thousand strong headed by many horsemen charged down upon the face and left flank of the square they were some five hundred yards away and a cheer broke from the british square when it was evident that the long suspense was over and the supreme moment at hand volley after volley was fired and then seeing that the fire was taking but little effect and knowing that nothing discourages men so much as seeing their fire fail to stop the rush of an enemy sir charles wilson ordered the bugle to sound cease firing the order was obeyed the men stood steady until the enemy were within three hundred yards then the bugle call commence firing sounded and from the front and left face of the square sweeping volleys were poured into the crowded mass aim low and fire steadily men was the shout of the officers and so well were they obeyed that the front ranks of the arabs were mown down like grass for a time they still pushed forward but the fire was too terrible to be withstood and although a few of the leaders arrived within fifty yards of the square their followers hesitated when still at a distance of a hundred hesitation in the case of a charge is fatal the storm of bullets still tore its way through the mass the arabs wavered turned and were soon in full flight the battle had lasted but a few minutes but the victory was complete and three hearty cheers broke from the victors there was a halt for a few minutes for the men to fill up their pouches from the reserve ammunition and to have a drink of water they then moved forward again confidently expecting that the attack would be renewed but the arabs had had enough of it and the square moved on without interruption until half an hour after sunset they reached the river 
the wounded were at once carried forward to the water and then the troops were marched up by companies and each in turn were permitted to drink their fill then guards were posted and the exhausted troops threw themselves down on the ground the object of their long march was attained the nile was reached and thenceforth there would be no further suffering from want of water the next day communication would be opened with gordon's steamers their friends would in the morning be fetched in from the zareba and then there would be a long rest until the boat column arrived and the remainder of the force from cordy marched across to join them in the morning easton went across from his own company to the marines where is mr skinner he asked a sergeant he is down with the wounded at the river sir he had his left arm broken by a bullet just as we left the zareba he was just in front of me at the time and i made a shift to bandage his arm and tie it up to his body and then he took his place in the ranks again and kept on with them until we got here then when we halted he fainted right off and we carried him down to the hospital camp by the water easton at once went down to visit his friend he was lying on a stretcher well skinner i am awfully sorry to hear that you got hit how are you feeling old man i cannot say much for myself just at present it is only about half an hour since they finished bandaging me up and putting on splints they just stopped the bleeding last night and then i asked them to leave me alone until this morning they had lots of serious cases to attend to and mine would keep well enough besides i was so weak with loss of blood and so really done up that i felt that i could not stand any more then and i was asleep in a very few minutes however my arm woke me up before daylight and i was glad enough to have it put in proper shape though it hurt me deucedly i can tell you however it is comparatively easy now and i hope i shall be all right by the time the advance begins what a blessing it is having shade and water here it is indeed easton agreed now i must say good-bye for i don't know what is to be done and we are sure to be under arms directly the troops moved off in a few minutes after easton returned to his company and after carefully examining the ground a small village named abu kru a few yards from the river on rising ground entirely deserted by the natives was selected for a camp the wounded were at once carried up there and were left in charge of the heavies while the guards and mounted infantry started for the zareba the sussex being sent out on the right to watch metama and keep the enemy in check should they advance against the village the water-skins and camel-tanks were all filled for but little water had been left at the zareba and the men although they had scarcely eaten any food for the last forty-eight hours started in good spirits perfectly ready for another fight should the enemy try to stop them but although large numbers of them gathered on a hill near the town they abstained from any attack and the column reached the zareba where they were received with hearty cheers by its little garrison these had not been attacked during their absence although a scattered musketry fire had been kept up upon them until dark to this they replied vigorously and the guns had done good service to the square while on its march by keeping up a shell fire upon any bodies of the enemy that could be made out on the eminences near it the garrison had suffered great suspense after the square had disappeared from their sight for they could see large bodies of men hurrying in that direction and their anxiety was great when the sudden outburst of musketry told them that the square was attacked what the issue of the fight had been they knew not but their hopes that the arabs had been defeated increased as time went on and no attack was made upon themselves for had the enemy been successful they would speedily have poured down to the attack of the feebly defended baggage as soon as the column arrived the work of pulling down the walls of boxes and saddles getting the camels to their feet and loading them began 
so many of the camels had been killed that the number surviving was insufficient to carry down the stores. Therefore the smaller redoubt was left untouched, and a stronger garrison than before placed in it, and the rest moved down to the river. The troops all partook of a hearty meal before the start was made. Sir Herbert Stewart and the rest of the wounded were taken down in the calculets with the column. Rupert Clinton had remained in the Zaraba when the square had marched forward. He had been greatly exhausted by the night march, and had had a slight sunstroke before the square moved out. The doctors had therefore ordered him not to accompany it, but to stay at the Zaraba and assist the general and other wounded. "'You are looking very shaky, Clinton,' Easton said when he joined him. "'I am all right today,' he replied, rather heavy about the head but a bath and a long night's rest will set me up again. Skinner is all right, I hope. No, I am sorry to say he has got his left arm broken. I saw him for a moment before we started. He got hit just after he left here, but stuck to his company all through. I asked one of the surgeons, and he said that unless fever or anything of that sort came on, he was likely to go on all right and that he did not think there was much chance of his losing his arm. He has plenty of pluck, Skinner has. I should think so, Rupert said. A fellow who could play an uphill game of football, as he could, can be trusted to keep his courage up under any circumstances. Do you know what we are going to do, Easton? Are we going to attack Metama? I have not the least idea. It is a big place, a lot bigger than we expected, and there are a tremendous lot of fighting men there. It is fortunate they did not all make a rush at us together yesterday, although I don't think it would have made any difference. But it would be a very risky thing to attack such a place as that, swarming with fanatics, with our present force. It would be too big to hold if we took it, and we might lose two or three hundred men in the attack and street fighting and as it is said that a big force is coming down the river to attack us it would certainly be a risk and a big one to lose a lot of men in an attack on this place which we shall be able to take without any difficulty as soon as the rest of the force comes up i expect we shall try a reconnaissance if the arabs bolt and we find that we can take the place without hard fighting we shall take it but if they show a determination to stick there and defend it to the last, I think we shall leave it alone. The column returned to the river without meeting with any opposition, but it was evident from the number of Arabs who were seen moving about in the direction of Metama that the check of the previous day had by no means disheartened them, and that they were still in very considerable force in and around the town. Late at night the orders were issued for the troops to parade at half-past four in the morning, and leaving a small force to guard Abu Kru, or as it was sometimes called Gubat, the rest of the troops marched towards Metama. Two villages deserted by the inhabitants were passed, and then a view was obtained of the town. Crowds of Arabs were seen outside its walls. The officer in command of the company of grenadiers that was marching in extended order in front of the column, picked out twenty of the best shots and ordered them to elevate their sights to two thousand yards and fire five volleys. Great as the distance was, the effect was considerable. With the aid of glasses, two or three of the enemy were seen to fall, and the rest scattered in all directions and speedily took shelter within the walls. The seven-pounders then opened fire, but the shot produced little or no result, simply punching holes in the mud walls. The troops then moved nearer, marching along the southern side to see if any place suitable for an assault could be discovered. But everywhere the wall was loopholed, and the incessant fire showed that it was strongly manned. A croup gun on the walls presently opened fire with so accurate an aim that the column fell back a short distance. At this moment a cheer rose as four steamers were seen coming along the river, 
flying the egyptian flag they ran towards the shore and landed two hundred negro soldiers with some small brass guns these were speedily placed into position beside the seven pounders and the negro infantry advancing in skirmishing order opened fire at once they brought news that gordon was still holding out and also that three thousand of the enemy were on their way down and were but two days march away this news decided sir charles wilson against running the risk of materially weakening his force by an assault on the town and the column fell back to abu Kru. on their way a portion of the guards regiment was told off to search the groves and plantations to see that there were no arabs lurking there presently they came upon two camels grazing in a grove search about well men the officer in command said their owners may be hidden somewhere close in a minute or two the men called out here are two saddles sir hidden in the bushes they are scarlet and belong to one of our regiments the officers speedily gathered to the spot they are certainly our saddles the officer in command said how in the world did the camels get here i suppose they must have wandered away during the night march and been picked up by some of the arabs and driven on here but they are riding camels one of the others put in they must have belonged to some of the men who were missing on the night march the poor fellows were killed no doubt they may have ridden them on here easton suggested after they got separated from the column the camels may have smelt the water and come on here before daylight broke that is true easton you see one of these saddles has blood stains on it perhaps its rider was wounded we will search the grove thoroughly the search was renewed and in a few minutes a sergeant ran up to the group of officers we have found a man sir he belongs to the heavies he is insensible the officers hurried to the spot yes the poor fellow is a sergeant of the heavies no doubt you were right easton you see he has been wounded on the side he looks in a bad way there are two water bottles by him easton said one is empty and the other is half full he added as he took them up and shook them he must have a comrade somewhere no doubt he has easton he could scarcely have been in a condition when he arrived here to take off the saddles and hide them away what can have become of the other the grove was searched thoroughly from end to end but no sign found of the missing man some boughs were cut down and a rough stretcher made and upon this the sergeant was laid and the force then moved on the camels being saddled and mounted by two of the men and on arriving at the camp the sergeant was taken to the hospital as soon as dinner was eaten the men were paraded again a council had been held to decide upon the best course to be taken and it was decided that a fort should be built down by the river and that the whole force should establish itself there with the exception of the guards camel regiment which should remain at gubat so as to prevent any body of the enemy posting themselves there and keeping up an annoying fire upon the fort down by the river gubat had already been roughly fortified and the whole force was therefore set at work to erect with camel saddles and boxes a defense for the position by the river when this was done the wounded were all carried down to the new fort after the work was over rupert strolled up through the village to have a chat with easton as he was sitting there an orderly came up mr clinton the surgeon has sent me up with two letters that were found inside the jacket of the wounded sergeant who was brought in this afternoon one is directed to you and the other to captain percy clinton that is very curious rupert said taking the letters and turning them over in his hand how is the man going on orderly he is insensible still sir i believe the doctors say that it is fever and that his wound is not serious one of the men of his regiment who is in the hospital says he got it at abu Klea, and that it was attended to there thank you orderly that will do what in the world can the man be writing to me about and to my father which is still more curious 
i should say the best way of finding out clinton will be to open the letter well i suppose it will be rupert replied still it is always interesting to guess at a mystery before you find the key well guess away easton said stretching himself out on his back i never was a good hand at riddles it was some little time before rupert finding himself unable to find any solution whatever to the mystery opened the letter as he did so he stirred the fire by which they were sitting into a fresh blaze he read a few lines and uttered an exclamation of such intense surprise that easton sat up with a start what is it clinton it is the most extraordinary thing i ever came across easton you know the story about edgar and myself well this wounded sergeant is either his father or mine impossible easton exclaimed he did not look much above thirty besides no soldier of twenty-one years service and he must have had fully that would be out here rupert made no reply he was running his eyes rapidly through the letter good heavens he exclaimed edgar is out here he is a trumpeter in the heavies that is news rupert i congratulate you heartily old fellow you are sure that there is no mistake no there cannot be any mistake about that rupert said thrusting the letter into his tunic come along easton let us be off he goes by the name of ned smith wait a moment old man easton said laying his hand kindly on rupert's shoulder where was the letter written at cordy well clinton don't be too sanguine you know how terribly the heavies suffered at abu Klea. don't make up your mind too warmly to see your brother he may be among the wounded we left behind at abu Klea. he may and he stopped i won't think it rupert said it would be too hard after our searching for him for all these years to find out that but four or five days since he was in camp with us and to learn it only too late i won't think it i hope to god that it is not so clinton only i thought it best to prepare you for what may be possible which troop did he belong to the dragoon troop easton was silent for it was upon this troop that the heaviest loss had fallen well rupert went on let us go down and learn the best or the worst they walked down the slope to the new fort by the river and finding out where the heavies were bivouacked soon discovered the dragoons you go and ask easton rupert said nervously i dare not easton went on alone and presently accosted a sergeant sergeant can you tell me whether the trumpeter of your troop was wounded at abu Klea? is he here now he was wounded at abu Klea, sir though not seriously but he is not here now he was one of those missing on the night march he and sergeant bowen i hear the sergeant was found and brought in this morning very bad but i have heard nothing of smith but i expect that one of the camels brought in this afternoon was his in fact i know it was for it has got smith's number on the saddle it is likely that they would be together for the sergeant had taken a great fancy to the lad we all liked him he joined us at cairo from the hussars as our own trumpeter was taken ill he was a general favorite but sergeant bowen took to him specially thank you sergeant and easton turned and walked slowly back to where rupert was awaiting him you have bad news easton rupert said huskily i could see it as you stood talking to that man yes i have bad news easton said but hardly the worst clinton he is badly wounded then rupert groaned i am afraid it is worse than that clinton he is missing it was he who was the rider of the second camel that we found in the grove this morning he and the sergeant were both missing on the night march and evidently found their way down to the river where we discovered the sergeant what can have become of your brother since i know not evidently he left his water bottle by his comrade and went somewhere probably to join us as i was saying to you when we were chatting about it before you opened that letter he was probably either making his way towards the square on the day of the fight or coming towards our camp after we got in 
and was seized by the arabs that was the conclusion at which we all arrived though i had little thought when we were talking it over that the missing man was your brother then you think he has been killed rupert said hoarsely i don't know that clinton he may have been made a prisoner you see we have searched the ground between that grove and our camp thoroughly to-day and had he been killed there i think we should certainly have found him of course it may have happened farther out on the plain if he was making his way out to join our square but i should think he would never have done that for the arabs were swarming all round it besides the hussars were scouting about all over the plains this morning and if they had seen the body of any of our men would certainly have reported it the arabs in fight never show mercy but if they came upon him by himself they might very well have carried him off as a prisoner especially if he made no resistance you see they are all slave dealers at heart besides they might think that a white prisoner would be an acceptable present to the mahdi of course i know no more about it than you do but i should say that the chances are quite as great of his being taken prisoner as of his having been killed one is as bad as the other rupert said in a broken voice this is awful easton i will walk up to your camp again would you mind seeing the colonel of his regiment or the officer of his troop and find out what you can about him easton soon found one of the few surviving officers of edgar's troop can you tell me anything about trumpeter smith he asked i have reason to believe that he was a relative of a friend of mine and that he ran away and enlisted under a false name he bore an excellent character the officer said he came to us from the hussars at cairo and no one could behave better than he has done from the time he joined us they would not have sent him to us if he hadn't been a thoroughly well-conducted young fellow i was chatting with one of the officers of his regiment on the day we left cairo he spoke in very high terms of him and said that he was quite a popular character in the regiment it seems that he was a first-rate cricketer and especially brought himself into notice by some exceedingly plucky conduct when two ladies belonging to the regiment were attacked by a couple of tramps at aldershot and besides that he had greatly distinguished himself at el teb where the hussars got badly mauled his name was amongst those sent in for the victoria cross and he was specially chosen to go with us to give him another chance i never heard a young fellow more warmly spoken of we were awfully sorry when we heard that he was missing there is no doubt he was with sergeant bowen whom your men brought in this morning one of the two camels was the one he rode we have been talking that over to-day and the general opinion is that he was caught by the arabs as he was trying to rejoin the regiment it is a thousand pities he did not wait a little longer in that grove but i have no doubt he was anxious to get assistance as soon as possible for the sergeant i intend as soon as we are settled here to ask the colonel to let me go out with a party to search the plains to see if we can find his body i am more inclined to think that he has been taken prisoner easton said he would hardly have gone out to meet the square as he must have seen the plains swarming with arabs and that he had no chance whatever of getting through he would have known that we were making for the water and that he would have a far better chance of reaching us by waiting until we got there my own idea is that he did wait and that the arabs came upon him somewhere between that grove and our camp if so they did not kill him for if they had done so we must have found his body to-day for we searched every foot of the ground i think he is a prisoner in their hands he had better have been killed at once the officer said i agree with you except that it is just possible that a slave may escape you see on our way up to khartoum if we defeat the mahdi's troops which we certainly shall do all the country will no doubt submit and there would be in the first place the chance of his being given up to us and in the second of his escape 
"'It is possible,' the officer agreed, "'but I certainly would not build on that. "'The probability is that, if he is taken prisoner, "'he will be sent to the Mahdi, "'and if he isn't killed at once when he gets there, "'he will be when the Mahdi sees that his game is up.' "'Easton nodded, and then, thanking the officer for his information, "'took his way up to the village, "'where he repeated to Rupert what he had heard. "'His own voice faltered as he told the story, while Rupert sobbed unrestrainedly. When he had finished, Rupert rose, pressed his hand silently, and then, returning to his own bivouac, threw himself down and thought sadly for hours over the loss of his brother. The next day Rupert was busy from morning until night. A portion of the force was employed in strengthening the fortification of the two posts, and a strong body was at work cutting wood for the use of the steamer in which Sir Charles Wilson was to start next morning for Khartoum. While at work, they were guarded by another strong party, lest the enemy should make a sudden attack. All, however, passed off quietly, and on the following morning Sir Charles started with two steamers, taking with him twenty men of the Sussex Regiment and one hundred and fifty of the black troops. On the same day, three hundred troops selected from the various regiments started on camels, with four hundred baggage camels under their convoy, for Gactel, in accordance with the orders given to General Stuart by Lord Wolseley at starting, that as soon as he had established himself upon the river, he was to send back a convoy for some more stores. The convoy was, however, but a small one, for of over two thousand camels which had left Cordy, this number alone survived, and most of these were in such a state from exhaustion, starvation, and sore backs that they were wholly unfit to travel. The force on the river was now reduced to some fifty officers and eight hundred and seventy men, including medical staff, commissariat, natives of all kinds, and the remainder of the black troops, and one hundred and twenty wounded. The defenses were greatly strengthened, officers and men both sharing in the work. During the day the hussars scouted round the camp, frequently exchanging shots with the enemy. At night strong lines of sentries were posted round the forts. No attack was, however, made, although the natives sometimes showed in considerable force during the day, and the beating of tom-toms went on day and night round Metama. The hard work upon which the troops were engaged kept them for the most part in good health, and the wounded did extremely well, the doctors themselves being surprised at the rapidity with which wounds healed and the men recovered their strength, an effect doubtless due to the clear, dry air. The troops in the village enjoyed better health than those down by the river, as they obtained the benefit of the air from the desert, while down near the stream heavy dews fell at night and there were several slight cases of fever. All looked eagerly for the return of the steamers from Khartoum, with news how things were going on there. As for their own position, no one had the slightest anxiety. No news had been received of the approach of the three thousand troops, which had been reported as on their way down against them, and they felt confident in their power to repulse any attack that the enemy at Metama could make against them. They were, too, in hourly expectation of the arrival across the desert of reinforcements from Cordy. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of Dash for Khartoum This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Dash for Khartoum by George Alfred Henty. Chapter 14. A Slave. Although Edgar had felt disappointed when the sounds of the firing round Metama died away, and he knew by the triumphant shouts of the Arabs that the British had retired, he had hardly expected that an attack would be made upon the town until reinforcements came up, and he consoled himself with the idea that within a few weeks at the utmost 
the reinforcements would arrive, and that, if the Arabs remained in the town until that time, he would be rescued. Two or three days later he heard a great hubbub just after nightfall in the streets outside. The Arabs who were in the courtyard snatched up their guns, and the din became louder than before. Above the uproar Edgar could catch the words, Death to the Kaffir, and Send him to the Mahdi, and guessed that his own fate was the subject of dispute. Picking up one of the Arab swords, he determined at least to sell his life as dearly as he could. For an hour his fate trembled in the balance. At times there were lulls in the tumult, while a few voices only, raised in furious argument, were heard. Then the crowd joined in again, and the yells became deafening, and every moment Edgar expected to hear the clash of weapons, and to see the little party to which he belonged driven headlong into the house, followed by the Mahdi's men. But he had before witnessed many Arab disputes, and he knew that however furious the words and gestures might be, they comparatively seldom came to blows, and though greatly relieved, he was not altogether surprised when at last the uproar quieted down and his captors returned into the courtyard and barred the door behind them. In a short time an argument broke out, almost as furious and no less loud than that which had taken place outside. The sheik had evidently his own opinion and was determined to maintain it. Two or three of his followers sided with him, but the rest were evidently opposed to it. From the few words Edgar could catch in the din, he gathered that the sheik was determined to carry him off as his own particular slave, while the bulk of his followers were in favor of handing him over to the Mahdi's officers. All Arabs are obstinate, but the sheik happened to be exceptionally obstinate, and determined even for an Arab, had the Mahdi's officers recognized his right to the captive and offered him some small present in return for his slave, he would probably have handed him over willingly enough, but that they should threaten him and insist on his handing over his property was, he considered, an outrage to his dignity and independence. Was he, an independent sheik, to be treated as if he were a nameless slave? and ordered to surrender his own to the Mahdi or anyone else? Never! He would slay the slave and stab himself to the heart, rather than submit to be thus trampled on. If his followers did not like it, they were free to leave him and to put on white shirts and follow the Mahdi. He could do without such men well enough. What would the Mahdi do for them? he would send them to be shot down by the Kaffirs, as they had been shot down at Abu Klea and outside the town, and someone else would possess their wives and their camels and their fields. If they liked that, they could go, and he went to the gate, unbarred and threw it open, and pointed to the street. The effect was instantaneous. The Arabs had no desire whatever to become soldiers of the Mahdi, and they at once changed their tone and assured the sheik that they had no idea of opposing his wishes, and that whatever he said should be done, pointing out, however, that in the morning the Mahdists would assuredly come and take the prisoner by force. The sheik was mollified by their submission, and ordering Edgar to close and bar the gate again, seated himself by the fire. By tomorrow, he said, we will be far away. I am not a fool. I am not going to fight the Mahdi's army. As soon as the town is still, we will make our way down to the river, take a boat, and cross. Two days' journey on foot will take us to the village where we sent our camels with the plunder and came here to fight, believing, like fools, that the Mahdi was going to eat them up. We have seen what became of that, and they say that there are crowds more of them on the way. I am ready to fight. You have all seen me fight over and over again, 
and all men know that sheik el bakhat is no coward but to fight against men who fire without stopping is more than i care for they are kaffirs but they have done me no harm and i have no vengeance to repay them fortunately we did not arrive till an hour after the fighting was over or our bones might be bleaching out there in the desert with those of hundreds of others it is the mahdi's quarrel and not mine let him fight if he wants to i have no objection why should i throw away my life in his service when even the slave we have captured is not to be my own as these sentiments commended themselves to his followers the sheik's plans were carried out the unfortunate trader and his wife who had been cowering in a little chamber since the sheik and his party had unceremoniously taken possession of the rest of the house were called in and informed that their guests were about to leave them and were ordered to close the gate after them and on no account to open it until morning the party then set to work to cook a large supply of cakes for the journey a little before midnight they sallied out and making their way noiselessly through the streets issued out near the river at a point where the walls that surrounded the other sides of the town were wanting there were several boats moored against the banks and choosing one of them they allowed it to drift quietly down the river until some distance below the town and then getting out the oars rowed to the other side of the river and landed below the large town of shendi they made a wide detour to get round the town travelling at a long swinging trot that soon tried edgar's wind and muscles to the utmost he was not encumbered by much clothing as before leaving he had been made to strip and to wrap himself up in a native cloth before he did so however he had been rubbed from head to foot with charcoal from the fire for his captors saw that the whiteness of his skin which greatly surprised them for his face and hands were tanned to a color as dark as that of many of the arabs would instantly betray him the perspiration was soon streaming from him at every pore but he well knew that any display of weakness would only excite the contempt of his captors and although he was several times well-nigh falling from fatigue he kept on until when many miles away from metama the natives slackened their pace and broke into a walk i thought edgar muttered to himself that a good long run with the hares and hounds at cheltenham was pretty hard work but it was nothing to this this climate does take it out of one and no mistake there is one thing i have got to get accustomed to it and am not likely to try any other for some time they continued the journey until morning broke and then turned off to the left and after miles of walking halted among some sand-hills outside the zone of cultivated land edgar was ordered to go and find some fuel for the morning was cold and even the arabs felt the keen air after their exertions edgar at once hurried away and was fortunate enough to find some dried stalks of maize in a field not far off pulling it up by the roots he collected a large bundle and carried it on his shoulder to the point where he had left the arabs an exclamation of satisfaction greeted his arrival the sheik produced a box of matches from a corner of his cloth for european goods were obtainable in metama and they had found several boxes in the house that they had occupied a fire was soon blazing and the arabs squatted closely around it while edgar tired out with his journey threw himself on the ground some distance away the sheik was in high spirits he was in the first place glad that he had had his way and carried off his captive and in the second he felt assured by the manner in which edgar had kept up with them by the way and by the speed with which he had collected the materials for a fire that he would turn out a very useful slave before starting they had partaken of a good meal 
and each of them had carried off a bag of five or six pounds in weight of dry dates from the merchant's store a few of these were eaten and then the whole party lay down to sleep the sheik first rousing edgar and ordering him to lie down between him and another arab tying a cord from his wrists to theirs so that he could not move without disturbing one or the other of them a few hours rest was taken and then with the sun blazing overhead the journey was recommenced they now kept among the sand hills so as to avoid the villages near the river in case a party should be sent out from metemmeh in pursuit of them edgar had difficulty in keeping up with the rest for the hot sand burned his naked feet and he had to avoid the prickly grass through which his companions walked unconcernedly they continued their journey until nightfall and then went down to the river for a drink edgar had suffered greatly from thirst which he had in vain endeavoured to assuage by chewing dry dates his feet were causing him agony and after satisfying his thirst he sat with them in the water until his companions again moved back into the desert edgar could not obtain a wink of sleep for the pain of his feet and in the morning he showed them to the sheik who only laughed at their raw and swollen condition as however he was desirous that his slave should continue in good condition he told him to tear off a strip from his cotton cloth and himself walked down to the river with edgar there he allowed him to again bathe his feet and showed him some broad smooth leaves which he bade him gather these were placed under his feet which were then bandaged with the strip of cotton as soon as this was done they returned to the party and again set out edgar found the application greatly relieved the pain and as the leaves and bandages kept the feet from contact with the sand he was able to get on fairly he felt too the benefit from the drink of water he had obtained from the river and was able to keep up with the party until late in the afternoon they approached the village where the natives had sent their camels edgar was left in charge of two of the arabs half a mile from the village when the others went on the sheik saying that in the morning they were to await him half a mile on the other side of the village there was a good deal of grumbling on the part of the men who were left with edgar and he saw that nothing would please them better than to cut his throat but when they looked threatening towards him he simply laughed knowing that they dare not use their weapons and that did they venture to strike him with hand or stick he was a match for both of them it was nearly two years now since he had stood up against the two tramps at aldershot and in that time he had grown from a lad to a powerful young fellow with every muscle hardened by exercise perhaps the men concluded that the experiment was not worth trying and presently left him to himself and entered into an animated conversation together when it became dark they insisted on tying edgar's legs and to this he made no objection for he understood that here they were only obeying the orders of the sheik a few minutes later he was sound asleep and did not wake once until he was roused by the arabs stirring they untied his feet and at once started on their way in less than half an hour they were at the spot the sheik had named in a few minutes he came up with six of his men mounted on camels and four spare animals the two arabs and edgar mounted three of these and the journey was continued they struck off from the river and journeyed all day among sand hills among which they camped for the night they had brought water skins with them and edgar received his share they started at daybreak again and travelling the whole day came down at night upon a small village at a short distance from the river here the sheik had evidently friends for he was warmly greeted as they entered by the conversation at the camp on the previous evening edgar had gathered that the rest of the party had gone off to villages to which they belonged in that neighbourhood and that those with the sheik belonged to the village of basagra near khartoum that word being frequently repeated 
before entering the village a short stay had been made while some pieces of wood were burned and edgar was again rubbed over with charcoal when they arrived at the house at which the sheik intended to stop edgar was directed to follow him while the rest looked after the camels on entering the house he was told by the sheik to go into a little courtyard where a negro presently brought him a dish of boiled meal and some water he heard a great talk inside the house but could understand nothing of what had been said half an hour later two of the arabs came in and lay down beside him as before and in addition his feet were firmly tied the next morning the party still further divided the sheik with two men and edgar starting alone he felt sure that they were now some distance above khartoum as the city lay less than eighty miles from metemah they had made he calculated fully fifteen the first night they had walked at least five-and-twenty on the second and had ridden thirty he calculated on each of the last two days on these they had not as he noticed by the sun followed a straight course going far to the east of south on the first day and to the west of south on the second having doubtless made a large detour to avoid the city during the whole time they had been travelling over a trackless country and had met no parties of natives on the way they started again before daybreak and now travelled along the bank of the river here the country had been cultivated for some distance back and villages were scattered here and there nevertheless they passed but few natives and edgar saw that many of the houses were roofless and that there were signs of fire and destruction everywhere and understood that this ruin had been wrought by the hosts of the mahdi about midday they arrived at a village on the bank its name edgar learned by the exclamations of the arabs when they caught sight of it was gerada here a large native boat was lying moored bidding edgar remain among the camels the sheik alighted and was for half an hour engaged in bargaining with two men who were apparently owners of the boat terms were at last agreed to the camels were led down and placed on board and the boat pushed off the sheik made a peremptory sign to edgar to lie down and cover his head with his cloth and edgar heard him say to the boatman my slave is ill the river was now at its shallowest and the men were able to pull the boat across edgar was hurried ashore with the camels while the sheik remained behind settling with the boatman they were now he knew between the two niles which joined their waters at khartoum the country here had evidently been rich and prosperous before the host of the mahdi passed like a blight over it they halted a few miles from the river near a ruined and deserted village edgar was told to watch the camels while they plucked heads of corn from the deserted fields while the arabs lit a fire and baked some cakes none of these were offered to edgar who had to content himself with some heads of dried maize that he picked from the field two days later they arrived at the bank of the white nile they followed it for upwards of a mile and then the sheik who evidently knew the way turned off the bank into the river the others following the ford for such it was was shallow the water scarcely coming up to the girths of the camels although the journey had been a short one they halted again for the night in cultivated ground a mile from the river and edgar was ordered to pick corn the fields had already been ransacked and it was only here and there that he found a head of maize hidden in its brown cases after a time the two arabs joined in the search and by nightfall a good-sized sackful had been collected at daybreak the camels were taken to a well where the apparatus for drawing the water still stood with a trough beside it when edgar had filled the trough the camels were urged to drink their fill being taken back once or twice to the trough until they could drink no more the water skins were filled the arabs took long draughts from a bucket and the sheik ordered edgar to do the same then the bag with their maize was fastened on the back of the spare camel 
which was already laden with a miscellaneous collection of goods, and the party started. Edgar understood by the preparations that had been made that they had still a serious journey before them, and it proved to be so. For eight days they travelled across a desert, their course being to the north of west, marching from early dawn until sunset. The moment the day's journey was over, he was set to work to gather tufts of coarse grass growing among the rocks, which cropped out here and there from the sand. Other vegetation there was none, save some low stunted bushes, which he also gathered whenever he came across them. With these and the grass a fire was lighted, and the sheik and his two followers roasted a few heads of maize for their own eating, and with these and a handful of dry dates appeared perfectly satisfied. After they had done, Edgar was permitted to roast some maize for his own use. The camels had each a dozen heads given to them. Except at one halting place, where there was a muddy well, they received no water. The Arabs themselves drank sparingly, and Edgar received but a mouthful or two of the precious fluid. Towards the end of the eighth day the Arabs began to hasten their camels, and soon afterwards, on mounting an eminence, Edgar saw some tents standing in a small green valley ahead. The Arabs fired their guns and uttered loud yells, and at once some figures appeared at the entrances of the tents and hastened towards them. In five minutes the two parties met. There were a few men among those that came out, but the majority were women and children. All uttered shouts of welcome, and a babble of questions arose. The sheik did not alight from his camel, but with his followers continued his way until he reached the encampment. Here, dismounting, he entered one of the largest of the tents. The other two Arabs were surrounded by the natives, and Edgar stood by the camels doubtful as to what he was expected to do next. He was not left undisturbed long. The Arabs had evidently told the news that their black comrade was a white slave whom the sheik had captured, and all crowded round him, examining him with the greatest curiosity. There was nothing to them remarkable about his color, for he was darker than any of them, but his hair, closely cropped like that of all engaged in the expedition, evidently amused them much. One of the women quickly fetched a large gourd full of water and made signs to him to wash himself, which he was glad enough to do after his four days' dusty journey. But before commencing he plunged his face into the bowl and took a long drink. Shouts of surprise and amusement arose, as with diligent rubbing he gradually got rid of the thickest part of the charcoal, and his skin began to show through. "'I wish to goodness,' he muttered to himself, "'I had got a cake or two of soap here, but I suppose it is a thing they never heard of. Even a scrubbing-brush would be a comfort. I shall be weeks before I get myself thoroughly white again. It is completely ground into my skin.' He had, however, managed to get rid of the greater part of the charcoal, and was from the waist upward a dingy white, when the sheik came out from his tent. He was followed by a good-looking Arab woman. He called Edgar to him and said, This is your mistress. Edgar had during the journey guessed that he was intended as a special present for the sheik's wife, and that his lot would depend in no slight degree upon her, and resolved to do his utmost to earn her good opinion. He therefore bent on one knee, and taking her hand placed it on his head. The woman laughed good-naturedly, and said something to the sheik, which by its tone Edgar felt was an expression of approval. The camels had all this time remained kneeling, and the sheik now ordered them to be unloaded. Edgar had wondered what the various bundles might contain, and looked with almost as much curiosity as the expectant Arabs at the process of opening them. As their contents were gradually brought to light, he understood at once why the sheik and his followers had taken no part in the fight outside Metama. They had evidently been far out in the desert, on the track the column had followed, 
on the search for loot. The collection was a singular one, and it appeared to Edgar that they must either have got hold of three or four of the camels that had strayed away from the column, or had followed the troops and rifled boxes and cases that had fallen from the backs of the animals on their way through the trees, or that had been left behind when the camels fell. Here were articles of clothing of all sorts, shirts, socks, khaki suits, boots, ivory-backed brushes, the property, no doubt, of some officer of the guards or heavies, a hand-glass, a case of writing materials and paper, a small medicine chest, some camp kettles, two or three dozen tins of cocoa and milk, and as many of arrowroot, scores of small tins of liebig, these three lots clearly forming part of the burden of one of the hospital camels, a handsome field-glass, an officer's sword without a scabbard, a large bundle of hospital rugs, a tin box marked T ten pounds, a number of tin drinking cups, plates, knives, forks, and spoons, and a strange collection of odds and ends of all sorts. Each article that was taken out caused fresh excitement. Its uses were warmly discussed, and Edgar was presently dragged forward and ordered to explain. The various articles of clothing particularly puzzled the Arabs, and Edgar had to put on a shirt and a pair of trousers to show how they should be worn. The chocolate and arrowroot had apparently been brought chiefly for the sake of their tins, and one of the Arabs illustrated their use by putting one of them down on a rock, chopping it in two with his sword, cleaning out the contents, and then restoring as well as he could the two halves to the original shape. Some of the children were about to taste the arrowroot scattered about the ground, but the sheik sharply forbade them to touch it, evidently thinking that it might be poison. Edgar was consulted, and said that the contents of all the tins were good. As they were evidently anxious to know their uses, he took one of the tin pots, filled it with water, and placed it over the fire. Then, with one of the Arab's knives, he opened a tin of chocolate, cutting it carefully round the edge, so that it should make a good drinking tin when empty. When the water boiled, he took out some of the contents of the tin with the spoon and stirred them into the pot, and poured the contents into a dozen of the cups. The sheik still looked a little suspicious, and ordered him to drink one first, which he did with deep satisfaction. The others then followed his example, and evidently approved very highly of the compound, and another pot of water was at once placed on the fire. Edgar was then requested to show what were the virtues of the white powder and of the little tins. He said that both these were good for people who were ill. The Arabs, however, were not satisfied without making the experiment. The arrowroot was not approved of, and the chief would have ordered the tins to be all opened and the contents thrown away, but on Edgar continuing to insist that they were good for illness, he told his wife to put them away in the tent. The Liebig was warmly approved of. Edgar explained that it was good for sickness and good for a journey. The Arabs, seeing how small a quantity was required for making a tin of broth, at once recognized this, and the sheik ordered his wife to take great care of them, and said they were to be used only on a journey. The medicine chest, with its bottles of various sizes, was also the subject of great curiosity, and one of the women, going into a tent, brought out a girl seven or eight years old, and requested Edgar to say which was the medicines that were suitable for her case. Edgar felt the child's pulse, and found that she was in a high state of fever. Quinine was, he knew, a good thing for fever, but whether it ought to be administered to a patient in that stage, he did not know. He told the sheik that he was not a Hakim, but that if he wished, he would give the child the medicine that he thought was best suited to it, but he could not say for certain whether it would do it good. The sheik, who, like all the rest, was deeply interested in the contents of the chest, said he must do his best. 
he accordingly gave the child a dose of quinine and told the mother to give her a cup of the arrowroot and that in two hours she must take another dose of the quinine the last subject of investigation was the tea there was a small sliding trap at the top of the tin and when edgar poured out half a cup of the contents these were examined with great curiosity the men took a few grains in their fingers smelt them and then tasted them the result was unsatisfactory and they were content to watch edgar's proceedings before they went further when he had the water boiling he put the tea into a tin pot and poured the water over it and when it had stood a few minutes served it out the verdict was universally unfavorable and the chief in disgust at having brought a tin of useless stuff so far kicked it over and over seeing that edgar had drunk up his portion with satisfaction the sheik's wife told him that if he liked the nasty stuff he might keep it for himself a permission of which he very thankfully availed himself the uses of all the articles being explained the sheik proceeded to a distribution he took the lion's share for himself gave a good portion to the two men who had followed him and a very small one to each of the other grown-up men and women in the camp he ordered edgar to carry his portion into the tent where under the instructions of the sheik's wife the articles were all stowed away the tent which was a large one was constructed of black blanketing woven by the women from camel's hair and was divided into two portions by the hanging of the same materials the one next to the entrance was the general living and reception room that behind being for the use of the sheik's wife and children there were two female slaves who slept in a tiny tent constructed of a blanket in the rear of that of the sheik and two negro slaves who looked after the camels tilled the ground and slept where they could the sheik's wife was evidently pleased with edgar and regarded him as her special property darkness had fallen long before the examination of the booty had concluded and as soon as he had carried the sheik's share into the tent she gave him a bowl of camel's milk and some meal in a gourd and also bestowed on him one of the black blankets and pointed out to him a place where he was to sleep just outside the tent it might be a great deal worse edgar said to himself as he ate his supper the sheik himself does not seem to be a bad fellow and at any rate i owe him my life for his obstinacy in sticking to me instead of handing me over to the mahdi's people his wife is evidently disposed to be kind and my work will be no harder than an agricultural laborer's at any rate as long as we stay here this is an out-of-the-way sort of place and if it does not lie on the route between any two places is not likely to be much visited it certainly looks as if the sheik regarded it as his private property which he would not do if it were a regular caravan halting place it is likely enough that there are very few people who know of its existence we traveled something like fifty miles a day and must be three hundred miles to the west of the nile what i have got to do now is to work willingly so as to keep in the good graces of the sheik and his wife and to learn the language so as to speak it fluently it is no use my thinking about escaping until i can pass as a native unless of course i hear that we have gone up and taken khartoum i wonder how they are getting on at metama and whether they have found the sergeant if they have it is likely enough when he finds that i have never reached the camp he will go to rupert and tell him who the trumpeter of his troop was i hope he won't it is much better that they should wonder for some years what has become of me and at last gradually forget me than know that i am a slave among the arabs i am sure that would be a great grief to them all and i hope they will not know anything about it until i return some day and tell them he was very glad of his blanket for the nights were cold and when he had finished his supper he wrapped himself up in it and was soon asleep he was awoke at daylight by voices inside the tent 
and a few minutes later the sheik and his wife came out and seeing edgar standing there the sheik ordered him to go and assist the other slaves but amina pouted i thought you had brought him home as a present to me what use will he be to me if he is to work in the field all day with the others but the kaffir must do some work amina he cannot have his food for nothing of course he shall work when i don't want him the woman said but i shall find much for him to do he will draw the water he will fetch the fuel he will grind the meal when i have anything else for the women to do when he has done all i require of him then he can go and work in the fields it is no use your giving me a slave and then taking him away again well well the sheik said do with him as you will women are always pleased with novelties you will soon get tired of having this kaffir about the tent but keep him if you will amina took one of the large hospital kettles and putting it into edgar's hands pointed to the well which lay a hundred yards away and told him to fetch water when he returned with it she bade him go out and gather fuel the last order was by no means easy to execute the arab fuel consisted almost entirely of dried camel's dung as the scrub very speedily becomes exhausted for a considerable distance from a camp edgar took a rough basket to which amina pointed and was away for some hours following the track by which he had arrived and making a circuit of the oasis and returned with the basket piled up with the fuel amina was evidently well satisfied with the result of his work for fuel is one of the great difficulties of arab life in the desert she rewarded him with a calabash of meal has my lady anything more for me to do he asked when he had finished his food not now she replied then i will go out and help the others in the field and he walked off to where the negroes were engaged in watering a plantation of maize the process consisted of drawing water from the well in leathern buckets and pouring it into channels by which it was conducted to the plantation the negroes looked at him sourly as he took hold of the rope attached to the long swinging beam that acted as a lever to bring the bucket to the surface and one of them muttered in arabic kaffir dog slaves as they were they despised this white christian well look here edgar said in english letting go the rope the sooner we come to an understanding the better i am not going to stand any nonsense from you fellows and if you don't keep a civil tongue in your heads i will give you such a licking as will teach you to do so in future although they did not understand his words they guessed the import of them and the biggest of the men a powerful negro repeated the word kaffir and spat upon him edgar's right arm flew out from his shoulder the blow struck the negro on the nose and in an instant he was upon his back upon the ground his comrades stood for a moment stupefied and then with loud yells ran towards the tents leaving the negro to pick himself up at his leisure edgar continued the work of raising and emptying the bucket until the negro returned followed by the sheik his wife and all the inhabitants of the village by this time the negro who had been knocked down had risen to his feet and was roaring like a bull at the top of his voice while the blood was streaming from his nose what is this the sheik shouted in great anger the negro volubly explained that the kaffir slave had struck down their comrade why is this the sheik demanded of edgar i am my lord's slave edgar said but this fellow is a slave also he called me a kaffir dog and spat upon me i knocked him down and if any other slave does the same i will punish him also as the woman whose child had been ill had a short time before reported that the fever had left her and that having drunk two basins of the arrowroot she was much better the sheik had been greatly pleased with the idea that he had made a far more valuable capture than he had anticipated he therefore received edgar's explanation in his broken arabic favorably the white slave has done right he said 
who are you that you are to insult him he came to work on my business and you would have interfered with and hindered him hamish has been rightly punished though truly the white man must have hit hard for his nose is flattened to his face mashallah it must have been a wonderful blow the white men are kaffirs but they have marvellous powers now go to work again and let me hear of no more quarrels the white man is my slave amina said stepping forward and addressing the negroes and if any one insults him i will have him flogged until he cannot stand he is a hakim and his medicines have saved the life of hamid's child he is worth a hundred of you and bestowing a vigorous and unexpected box on the ears to the negro standing next to her she turned and walked back to her tent accompanied by her husband while the rest of the villagers remained for some time staring at the negro and commenting upon the wonderful effect of the white man's blow End of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of dash for khartoum this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by k hand dash for khartoum by g a henty chapter fifteen bad news no sooner was work over in the afternoon of the day after that on which rupert had heard of his brother's loss then Skinner came across with Easton to see him. "'My dear Skinner, surely you are not fit to be walking about,' he said, as he saw them approaching. "'Oh, it won't do me any harm, Clinton. My arm is all in splints, and, as you see, bandaged tightly to my side. The doctor seemed to say that I had better not move, but I promised to take care of myself. I should have come, old man, if I had been ten times as bad.' Easton has just been telling me of this horrible business, so of course I came over to see you. I think from what he says you take too dark a view of it. There is no doubt in my mind that he is a prisoner, and that is bad enough. But these Arabs don't slaughter their prisoners in cold blood. They are not such fools as that. They make them useful. I own it must be disgusting to be a slave, especially to these Arabs, and of many fellows I should say they would never stand it any time. Easton wouldn't, for example. In the first place he wouldn't work, and in the next place, if they tried to make him, he would be knocking his master down, and then, of course, he would get speared. But I have great hopes of your brother. He was always as hard as nails, and I should have no fear of his breaking down in health. Then he is a chap that can look after himself. Look how well he has been going on since he bolted from Cheltenham. Then he is a beggar to stick to a thing, and I should say the first thing he will make up his mind to do will be to escape some day, and he will be content to wait any time till the opportunity occurs. You see, he has learnt a lot since he left school. He has been roughing it pretty severely. He has had over a year in this beastly hot climate, and will be able to make himself at home pretty near anywhere. I tell you, Clinton, I would lay odds on his turning up again even if he is left to himself." Besides that, if we go on to Khartoum and thrash the Mahdi, these Arabs will all be coming in and swearing that they are most grateful to us for freeing them from him, and you may be sure that any slaves they have will be given up at once. I don't say your brother is not in a hole, but I do say that he is just the fellow to get out of it. I have thought of everything you say, Skinner, and I do think that Edgar is as likely to make his escape some day as anyone would be under the circumstances, but I doubt whether anyone could do it. "'Why not?' Skinner asked, almost indignantly. "'I don't suppose he could make his way down the Nile, although he might do that. But there are several caravan routes down to the Red Sea, and then there is Abyssinia. The people are Christians there, and, they say, fighting against the Mahdi's Arabs now. So if he got there, he would be pretty sure to be treated well. I should say that there were lots of ways that he could escape. I don't mean now, but when he had got accustomed to the country.' It seems to me a fellow with pluck and energy such as he has got ought to find no great difficulty in giving the people he is with the slip, and making his way somewhere. I do think, Clinton, there is no occasion to feel hopeless about your brother. It may be a long time before you see him again, but I do honestly believe he will turn up some time or other. I begin to hope he will, Rupert said. 
at first i did not think so for a moment but now i have had time to look at it calmly i think that there is a chance of his getting off some day besides when we are once at khartoum and have scattered the mahdi's army i have no doubt general gordon will send orders through the land for all egyptian and european slaves to be brought in you know it is still hoped that some of hicks's officers may be alive and there is such a feeling for gordon throughout the country that his orders will be sure to be obeyed that is right clinton easton said that is the view i take of it myself and i am very glad to see that you have come to see it in that light and now will you tell us what there was in that letter that gave us the news of your brothers being brought out here how came the sergeant to write to you how did he know you were his brother it seems an unaccountable business all through i have not looked at the letter since rupert said it would have been very important if it had not been for edgar's loss as it is it does not seem to matter one way or the other still as you say it is very singular altogether it's coming into my hands and he took out the letter it began sir two days ago i was with the trumpeter of my troop when you passed by with two other officers one of them called you clinton and as i had an interest in the name it attracted my attention and i found that it also attracted the attention of the young fellow with me i questioned him and he acknowledged that he had been to school with you and the two officers with you good heavens skinner broke in to think that we three should have passed so close to your brother and that none of us should have recognized him how awfully unfortunate it is terrible to think of now rupert agreed and then continued reading the letter i then told smith which is the name the trumpeter went by that my interest in you consisted of the fact that for aught i knew i was your father he exclaimed that in that case it was probable that i was his father as he had been brought up with you he then told me how he came to enlist namely that my wife whom i have not seen since she left india and who was i thought dead long ago had been to him and had told him all about the change of infants and said that she had done it on purpose for his good and that she knew he was her son because you had a mole on your shoulder and she wanted him to go on pretending to be captain clinton's son and offered to swear that the other one was hers so that he might get all the money that is why i write this my name is humphreys i was a sergeant in the thirtieth and it was at agra when we were stationed there that the change of infants took place my wife went over to england i took to drink and disgraced myself and five years afterwards deserted i stayed in england for some years and then enlisted again in the fifth dragoon guards and being young looking gave my age as eight years younger than i was i now go by the name of bowen and am a sergeant and bear a good character in the regiment the lad did not wish me to say anything about this at any rate until the campaign was over but as we shall be marching in a day or two and it may be that i shall be killed i write a letter to you and one to captain clinton so that in case i am killed the truth may be known i affirm most solemnly that the statement made by my wife was a lie whether she did intend to change the children or not is more than i can say sometimes she said she did sometimes she said she didn't but at any rate she herself did not know which was which and did not discover the little mark on the shoulder until after the babies got mixed up over and over again i have seen her cry and wring her hands because she could not say which was which she acknowledged that she meant to make money out of it and lamented that she had lost her chance because she could never herself tell which was which of this i am ready to take my oath in any court of justice and if she says she knows now she is a liar i have read this letter over to troop sergeant matthews and have in his presence sworn on a bible to its truth he will place his name by the side of mine as witness to that and to my signature i remain your obedient servant john humphreys now known as john bowen the letter to your father is word for word the same as this i have written it in duplicate in case you should be killed before i am well that is plain enough easton said when rupert had finished it is just what you said all along the woman did not know which was her son and you and edgar stand in the same relation to captain clinton that you always did thank god for that rupert said we want no change and my father has said talking it over with me again and again he has two sons and loves us both equally and it would be a deep grief to him now to know for certain that one of us is not his son i will walk across to the hospital and ask how the sergeant is going on i am strangely placed towards him now 
it is a curious position easton said but in any case you do but stand towards him as a son would do towards a father who had given him up in infancy to be adopted by someone else rupert did not reply but saying wait here until i come back walked over to the hospital lines he returned in a few minutes the doctor says he is sinking he said gravely i shall go over there and remain until all is over will he be sensible at the last he asked the surgeon as he stood by the litter possibly the surgeon said i have a great interest in asking doctor i am most anxious to have a few words with him if possible before he dies if you will call me if he opens his eyes the surgeon said i will do what i can to rouse him his pulse is getting weaker and weaker i do not think the end is far off half an hour later the dying man opened his eyes rupert beckoned to the surgeon who came across at once and poured a few drops of spirits between his lips and moistened his forehead with a sponge dipped in vinegar and water do you know me humphreys rupert asked i am rupert clinton the dying man's face brightened then his lips moved where is smith he left me to get help he never returned he is away now rupert said anxious not to disturb the dying man when we got to you you were insensible that was two days ago edgar is not in camp at present there is a letter for you yes it was found on you and i have read it and i know how we stand towards each other and that perhaps you are my father here is the letter i will swear to it get a witness rupert called the surgeon doctor the sergeant wishes you to hear him swear that this letter was written by him and that its contents are true bible the sergeant said faintly a bible was brought and the dying man's hand placed upon it i swear he said in a firmer voice than that in which he had hitherto spoken that this letter was written by me and that every word in it is true and that neither i nor my wife nor anyone save god knows whether trumpeter smith or lieutenant clinton is my son the effort was made and he closed his eyes rupert took his hand and knelt beside him once again the sergeant opened his eyes and spoke good lads both he said better as things are a few minutes later he ceased to breathe the surgeon had retired after hearing the sergeant's declaration when he saw rupert rise to his feet he came up to him i have just written down the words he said and have signed my name as a witness to the fact that it was a declaration sworn on the bible by one who knew he was dying thank you rupert said it is a strange story i will tell you it some day after leaving the hospital rupert went to easton in whose judgment he had a great deal of confidence and after stating what had occurred asked him if in his opinion he could take any steps to learn more about edgar i think clinton that were i in your place i should go to the commanding officer and tell him you have learnt that the trumpeter who was with the wounded sergeant of the heavies found in the grove and who left him to fetch aid from our camp was your brother you can say that on account of a misunderstanding he left home and enlisted under a false name and begged that a search be instituted for his body and also that the politicals who are in communication with the natives should make inquiries whether any white captive had been brought into the metema if you like i will say as much to our colonel and i am sure that he will give orders that whenever detachments go out strict search will be made of all ground over which they pass i am afraid that if we do learn from the natives that he is at metema our chance of getting him back before we take the place is small for even if the people into whose hands he fell were willing to part with him for a ransom the fanatical dervishes would not allow it however there would be no harm in trying i know that to-day half a dozen natives came in with some cattle and grain and no doubt some others will be in to-morrow rupert took the advice and at once went over to the quarters of the officer in command and made the statement that easton had suggested the colonel expressed great regret and promised that every step should be taken to ascertain the fate of his brother and to endeavor to recover him if alive another party was sent out in the morning and a further and most minute search made of the ground between the camp and the grove where the sergeant had been found and the nineteenth hussars were directed while scouring the plain to search every depression and to examine every clump of bushes to discover if possible the body of a missing soldier or any sign of his clothes or accoutrement the political officer closely questioned all the natives who came in but these came from villages higher up the river and no news was obtained of what was going on at metema 
the next day there was a great outburst of firing in metema guns and cannon being discharged incessantly for two or three hours at first it was thought that some dispute might have arisen between the various tribes now occupying the place but this idea was abandoned when it was seen that the cannon on the walls were discharged not into the town but towards the open country and it was then concluded that some great festival of the mahdi was being celebrated the following day was sunday just as the troops were being formed up for a church parade a staff officer came up to rupert and his fellow aides de camp as they were buckling on their sword is anything wrong major rupert asked as he saw that the officer was much agitated yes we have terrible news a boat has just come down from wilson with the news that he arrived too late that khartoum has fallen and that gordon is murdered an exclamation of horror broke from the two young officers do you think it is true major i fear there is no doubt of it the steamers got up to the town and the mahdi's flags were flying everywhere and the vessels were peppered with shot from all the batteries there is other bad news wilson's steamers both ran aground and cannot be got off beresford is to go up and bring the party off that is if he can fight his way past the batteries you see that is what the firing in menema yesterday was about no doubt a messenger had arrived from the mahdi with the news of the fall of khartoum don't say anything about it of course the news will not be kept from the officers but it is best to be kept from the men as far as possible feeling almost stunned with the news rupert and his companions joined the rest of the staff and proceeded to the parade ground an hour after the service had concluded the terrible intelligence was known to all the officers the feelings of grief indignation and rage were universal all their efforts and suffering had been in vain all the money spent upon the expedition entirely wasted gordon and his egyptian garrison at khartoum had perished and it seemed not unnatural that the authorities at home should be blamed for the hesitation they had displayed in sending out the expedition to rescue the heroic defenders even at the last moment they had countermanded their orders for the purchase of camels which had they been available would have enabled general stuart's desert column to march straight across instead of being obliged to send the camels backwards and forwards and in that case the steamers would have arrived in time to save gordon for it was but two days before they reached khartoum that the town had fallen never was an expedition so utterly useless never did brave men who had fought their way through all difficulties find their efforts so completely vain the news could not long be kept from the men the words of passionate grief and indignation that burst from their officers were soon caught up and carried through the camp and the rank and file joined with their officers in a wholesale denunciation of those who were responsible for this disaster which had suddenly overtaken the expedition the future was warmly debated among the officers some maintained that the expedition having come so far the money having been laid out it would be allowed to finish its work to proceed to khartoum to recover the city crush the mahdi and restore peace and order to the sudan others asserted that after this failure to carry out the main object of the expedition the authorities at home might now hasten to withdraw an expedition which they had only with apparent reluctance sent out at all rupert feared that the latter alternative was the most probable and with it his hopes of seeing his brother before long were dashed to the ground it was maddening to think that he was lying a helpless prisoner in the hands of the arabs in the mud-walled town but two miles away for it was now probable that the force would march back and edgar be left to his fate easton and skinner in vain attempted to cheer him they had however no arguments to combat his conviction that the expedition would be abandoned and could only fall back upon their belief that sooner or later edgar would manage to make his escape from the hands of the arabs to rupert's distressed mind this was poor consolation lord charles beresford at once started up the river in a small steamer to rescue sir charles wilson's party as it was known that there was a strong battery below the spot where the steamers had been lost and that beresford would have to run the gauntlet of this on his way up much anxiety was felt as to the result and a constant and eager watch was kept up for a sight of the steamer on her return when the time came that she was expected to make her appearance and no signs were visible of her the anxiety heightened and when another day passed and still she did not return grave fears were entertained for her safety at last the welcome news came that smoke could be seen ascending from the river higher up and loud cheers burst from the men when the flag at the masthead was seen above the trees 
there was a general rush down to the shore of all who were not on duty to hear the news when she arrived and when she drew up near the bank and the first party landed it was found that her escape had been a narrow one indeed in passing the battery she had had a sharp engagement with the artillery there and a shot passed through her boiler and disabled her and she had been obliged to anchor fortunately she was a little above the battery when this took place the guns could not well be brought to bear upon her, and although assailed by a constant fire of musketry, her own guns, her gardener, and the rifles of the troops had kept the enemy at a distance, and prevented them from shifting any of their guns so as to play upon her, until an officer of the naval brigade, who was acting as her engineer, had managed to repair the boiler. While the fight was going on, Sir Charles Wilson's party were upon an island, near which the second steamer had sunk two miles higher up the river and were hotly engaged with a force upon the bank they were able to see that the rescuing steamer was disabled and at night had crossed to the river bank and marching down it to a point opposite the steamer opened communication with her by signals and then did what they could to divert the attention of the enemy from her by opening fire upon the battery with one of their guns causing the enemy to turn two or three of his pieces of artillery against them at nightfall they marched down the river to a point where the steamer had signaled she would pick them up the steamer ran past the battery in the morning and fortunately escaped without serious injury and then picking up the whole of sir charles wilson's party came down the river without further molestation all this time no dispatch of any kind had been received from corti although a small reinforcement consisting of a company of naval brigade and half a battery of artillery had arrived and the camels or rather a portion of them, for nearly half had died upon the journey, had returned from Gokdul with a supply of stores. The days passed heavily until, on the 10th of February, General Buller and the 18th Royal Irish arrived. Hopes were entertained, as they were seen approaching, that the appearance of the infantry signified that the expedition was still to continue to advance, but it was very soon known that the Royal Irish had merely arrived to cover the retreat. The next morning the whole of the wounded were sent off under a strong escort, then the work of destroying all the stores that had been brought up by the last convoy, except what were needed for the march down to Gokdul, were carried out, and two days later the forts that had been built with so much labor were evacuated, and the whole force set out upon their march down to Corti. This time the journey was performed on foot. The camels of the three corps and of the vast baggage train with which they had started were bleaching on the desert, and scarce enough animals remained for the service of carrying down the sick and wounded. Rupert Clinton was among them. His strength had failed rapidly, and a sort of low fever had seized him, and he had, for some days before the convoy started, been lying prostrate in the hospital lines. Skinner was, at his own request, carried by the same camel that conveyed Rupert, the beds being swung one on each side of it. He had protested that he was perfectly capable of marching, but the doctors would not hear of it, and when he found he could accompany Rupert he was glad they decided against him, as he was able to look after his friend and to keep up his spirits to a certain extent by his talk. Several of the wounded died on their way down, among them Sir Herbert Stewart, who had survived his wound a much longer time than the surgeons had at first believed possible. One piece of news that they had learned the day before they left the neighborhood of Metema had some slight effect in cheering Rupert. A native of that town having reported that a white prisoner had been brought in on the day after the battle near the town, he had been captured by some men of the Jarin tribe and not by the regular troops of the Mahdi. Three or four days later there had been a quarrel, the Mahdi's people wanting to take the prisoner and send him up to Khartoum. His captors had objected, claiming him as their private property but as they were only a small party he would doubtless have been taken from them by force had they not during the night stolen out of the town with him taken a boat crossed the river and made off thus there was evidence that edgar was still alive and skinner endeavored to impress upon rupert that in every respect the intelligence was favorable you see clinton if your brother had been sent up to the mahdi the villain would have endeavored to force him to change his religion edgar would never have done that and in that case it is pretty certain that they would have chopped his head off as it is the chief of these arabs who took him evidently means to keep him as a slave for himself of course it is not as pleasant to be a slave but it is better than having the choice between worshipping a greasy arab or having your head chopped off and it will give him time to learn the language to make his plans of escape and to carry them out rupert was too weak and ill to fully enter into the question but he did see that Edgar's position was certainly better under an Arab master than it would have been had he been sent up to Khartoum, 
and the knowledge that he was alive and was in no immediate danger of his life did much to revive him and enable him to bear the weary journey down to Corti better than he would otherwise have done once there the comparatively cool air of the hospital tents the quiet and the supply of every luxury soon had their effect and in the course of three weeks he was up and about though it would be some time before he would be fit for active duty it was still altogether uncertain what decision would be finally arrived at at home respecting the expedition but for the present the troops were stationed at various points on the river as far down as dongola and it was hoped that later on the advance against khartoum would be recommenced rupert as soon as he was able to get about had a long conversation with major kitchener the political officer who was in charge of all communications with the natives he related to him the circumstances of his brother's capture and how he was a prisoner of some men belonging to the jarin tribe major kitchener promised that his spy should make every inquiry and held out hopes that by the offer of a large reward his captors might be induced to bring him down to the camp the time passed very slowly the heat increased in intensity and became intolerable from nine in the morning until five in the afternoon between those hours there was nothing to do but lie still in the mud huts that had now been erected for it would have been well nigh impossible to exist in the little tents that the troops had brought with them in the early morning and in the evening everyone bathed in the nile then the officers each of whom had picked up some sort of pony from the natives went for a ride chased the wild dogs or wandered gun on shoulder in search of such game as was to be found after sunset was the only really pleasant time of day and when the moon was up both officers and men enjoyed themselves but on dark nights neither walking nor riding could be indulged in so broken was the ground and there was nothing to do but talk sing and vary the tedium by a game of cards the guards camel regiment were posted close to dongola rupert who since the death of general stuart had no longer any staff duties was attached to the transport corps and spent a considerable portion of his time going up or down the river in boats he did not therefore see much of his friends although he never passed dongola without managing to make it a halting place so as to have a few hours talk with them you have thoroughly picked up again clinton skinner said as he arrived upon one of these visits no one would know you to be the same fellow who was brought down to corti with me on that wretched camel's back i think you are very lucky to have got put on to that transport work so do i skinner it gives me little time to sit and think and though it is terrifically hot in the middle of the day i can always manage to get up some sort of shelter with straw or matting of some kind and at any rate it is cooler there than on shore i wish they would give me a turn at it skinner said i cannot offer to take an oar for although my arm is going on very well the doctor says it may be months before i can venture to use it in anything like hard work we get up jolly horse races here once a week in the evening the natives enter their animals of course we have no chance with them on our little tats but we sometimes manage to requisition two or three horses from the hussars i dare not ride myself for though the horses and ponies are both very sure-footed these natives ride in the wildest way and one might get cannoned over still it is an amusement to look on and make small bets and watch the natives crowds of them come out to see it and they get tremendously excited over it i wish we could get up a good football match the guards against dongola it would be awful fun as far as running goes we should not be in it and if one of them got the ball he would carry it right through us up to the goal for they are as active and slippery as eels of course when it came to a good close fight we should have it our own way have you managed to get up football on board ship skinner easton who was stretched at full length on the ground asked lazily not yet skinner laughed if we played it all we should have to use a cannon ball so that it could not be kicked over the sides but then unless we got iron shoes made for the purpose we should all be laid up but i have got a football in my cabin and once or twice we have had games at salkim and very good fun it was too no news i suppose clinton easton asked sitting up rupert shook his head not a word we hear very little of what is going on above us and the natives who do come in lie so there's no believing a word they say i have been thinking that if one could trust them i would pay one of the sheiks to dress me up and stain my skin and take me with him on a wandering expedition to khartoum and over the country on both sides of the river it would be madness easton said of course if you could talk their language perfectly it might be possible to manage it for i suppose that with dye and false hair one might be got up to pass as far as appearances go but not being able to speak the language would be fatal of course i should have to go as a dumb man i was asking the surgeon the other day if there would be any great difficulty in cutting a fellow's tongue out in doing what easton and skinner asked in astonishment 
cutting my tongue out rupert said seriously you see if my tongue was cut out anyone could see at once that i was dumb of course it wouldn't be pleasant but i believe it would be possible to get to talk after some time if there were no other objections i should not hesitate for a moment but unfortunately i should have to pass for deaf as well as dumb for of course i should not understand anything that was said to me i have been thinking it over in every light and really the only great objection i see to the plan is that though one might depend on the chief's being faithful if he were well paid it would be very doubtful as to his followers and are you really serious in saying that you would have your tongue cut out clinton of course i am serious rupert said almost angrily what is one's tongue in comparison to one's brother what do you think easton do you think the idea is at all feasible i may say that for the last two months i have been working almost night and day at the language i engaged a fellow the day i came out of hospital he was working for one of those greek shopkeepers he is a native of dongola but has been down in egypt and picked up a certain amount of french he goes about with me in the boat and we talk all day and as long as i can keep him awake at night of course i don't think for a moment that i could learn enough to pass as a native for at least a couple of years but it would be of no use my going up with a party of arabs if i could not make out what they say and learn what news they pick up and make arrangements to get edgar away if we find him it would be a fearfully risky business clinton easton said gravely the betting would be tremendously against you but i don't say that it is absolutely impossible that you should be successful i don't think it would be necessary to carry out the idea of having your tongue cut out as you say a tongue is nothing in comparison to a brother and if i thought that the loss of your tongue would ensure your success i should say nothing against it it would be a matter for you and you only to decide but i should think it might be managed in some other way the fellow you would be with would naturally avoid all large encampments and would send you off to look after camels or something if other natives arrived at the same encampment you don't really mean easton skinner said that you seriously think that it might be done that is that the betting is not more than ten to one against it no i don't think the odds are longer than that skinner you know burton went to mecca in disguise and i believe that it has been done since by somebody else i grant that burton could talk the language well and that having to play the part of a dumb man adds to the risk still i do not think as i said that the chances are more than ten to one against it well i shall think it over rupert said but i must be going now for the boat will be loaded by this time why did you encourage clinton in this mad idea easton skinner asked after rupert had left them i don't think i did encourage him i told him the betting was ten to one against his coming back alive and i don't call that encouraging but i believe it is possible and i am not at all sure that if i were in his place and the idea had occurred to me that i shouldn't try to carry it out End of chapter fifteen